I have so many gifts to offer the church that Jesus has given me, and I don't need a ring on my finger to use those gifts. And, and you know, by extension, I had a friend and I thought, is this all in my head? Am I just insecure? And she told me she got married. And right after she got married, she, she was asked to lead a Bible study. She started getting invited to things. She was drawn into this family. And I thought, okay, this is not just me. This is real. That also connects to draw, viewing singles as adults with gifts to offer the church and drawing them into the family. Hello and welcome to The Naked Gospel, where we explore, imagine, and re-envision what it looks like to follow Jesus and to actually know his gospel, to know his gospel with our bodies, with our imaginations, and with our relationships, and particularly with our sexuality. I am your host, Shane O'Neill. Today we are joined by Hope Johnson. Hope uh, is a recent friend. She's been writing for Proven Ministries. She's a a writer. She's a a teacher and she's also a podcaster. Uh, we'll hear more about that, but we are having her on just to have a conversation around singleness. I spent the first 30 years of my life single uh, and Hope is in a similar situation. So what does it look like to be single well? Uh, <sighs> this conversation is important because most people in the church right now are single, uh, but also most people, the most people leaving the church right now are single. Uh, And so what does it look like to actually know Jesus, who was single himself, along with a majority of the apostles, presumably, who were single, including Paul? Uh, So there's this rich heritage of singleness, uh, but for some reason we have a hard time inheriting it. We have a hard time processing it and giving it to those around us, especially within the church. So I want to have a conversation around that. Uh, Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with somebody uh, you think would benefit from it. Comments are always welcome. When uh, you want to share your thoughts, we're always happy to catch them. And Hope, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me, Shane. Yeah, this is cool. Um, Hope, would you just uh, paint a, a picture of what your life looks like right now? Sure, sure. So I'm primarily a writer. I'm doing a lot of things because of all this COVID stuff. So I'm working three part-time jobs, but my passion is writing. I'm working right now on a devotional project for Chosen Books, which comes out in March 2022. That's so cool. So that's my first big writing project. So cool. And really my passion right now is to encourage other singles in the church Mm. because I'm at a place where I never thought it would be. I'm, I'm turning 30 next month mm-hmm. and life did not go according to the narrative that I had inherited. Mm-hmm. And there are so many people, the more and more Christians I talk to feel the same way. So in my writing in particular in this season, that's what I want to do. I want to encourage and I want to point point them to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, that is particularly why we wanted you on. You've gone through a, a recent journey, um, and I think that that'll be kind of a lot of the landscape that we'll end up playing on. So there's been a recent journey, and I know some people have an aversion to that word, but like just a season mm-hmm. of something significant between you and Jesus. Could you tell us about that? And then we'll go ahead and just play within that landscape. Sure, sure. So this past summer, I had gotten to such a point of desperation in my singleness that I found myself in my bathroom, Mm. tears streaming down my face, pounding my fist, Mm. like actually hurting myself. Mm. Reminds me kind of one of Bale's prophets, you Mm. know, I'm just (laughs) just in the throes of what I would call idolatry. Mm. Some people might not call it that, but Tim Keller says something in Counterfeit Gods that I love, and it's that you know it's an idol if instead of saying, what a shame, you're saying, I've lost all hope. Mm. And at that point, I just turned 29 and I felt like I had lost all hope Mm. for a colorful life, for a purposeful life, for a meaningful life. And I came to a complete breaking point where those around me were saying, hope, this is is not healthy. You can't live like this. You need to set this aside. Mm. So 
on the advice of three wise people in my life. And they, this was all separate. None of them had talked to each other about this. They said the words, can you set this aside? And my best friend, I've known her for 11 years. She knows I tend to view things kind of black and white without nuance <laughs> as I'm working on. But she said, why don't you give yourself a time period? And you can call this a dating fast. And in reality, it wasn't much of a dating fast because I have not dated during this pandemic since my last breakup, but my mindset has been com a complete desperation. Yes, there's a, a difference. Sense. Yeah, there's a difference. So I made a commitment for three months. She wanted me to do six. I didn't think that I could be out of control of my life for six months. So I said, no, three. Mm. I committed to not reading any books, listening to any podcasts that had to do with dating or marriage. Mm because that was the primary mm. thing that I was feeding on, mm. even more than scripture. I would not pursue anyone's attention mm. because I had gotten in the pattern of, since I wasn't being pursued, I thought I must be doing something wrong. There must be something about me that is just inherently not enough mm. in some way. I need to work harder. So mm. I, I purposed that I would not do that. And then I also purposed, which was really hard, was I wasn't going to talk with my single friends about my desire for a husband. I wasn't going to talk with my single friends about how I was so frustrated that I lived in an area where there were no Christians. I was not going to orient my conversations in that direction. So that's the framework of where I started out this past September. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, <clears throat> I, liked, I liked what you said about not seeking someone's attention. I, <clears throat> Excuse me. I found that sexual integrity. Um, I've heard it like I've heard it phrased in the context of just singleness. And now I'm engaged. And I feel like sexual integrity is actually really starting in a lot of ways because mm -hmm. all those ways that. Uh, that we seek attention, uh, even even I'll notice at the gym, I'll um, catch someone's eye and then you'll know the possibility is there right and you uh -huh, can like create all uh -huh. sorts of narratives in your head yeah, and you carry on yeah. with your day like nothing ever happens but it's but it's uh it's tantalizing it's something there that mm -hmm. that you can uh, even if it's just a seed but it's a seed of a of, uh, of fantasy that you can play with for the rest of the day or in that moment you can feed your hubris your pride and say like i am desired i am wanted and it's mm -hmm. just those really quick glances throughout the day and learning to kill those which is essentially what you did it's not so much like oh i'm not going to date for three months but i'm going to kill the possibility of dating for three mm -hmm. months and that's mm -hmm. altogether different i think somebody listening to this will be like oh i haven't dated in three months i've done that uh -huh. uh, but that's very different than what you are saying you undertook because i liked i, I mean <laughs> i'm partial to it because i titled it but the 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 title of your your article the mm -hmm. death of options it really mm -hmm. is killing all options for three months because we micromanage our lives and we, can, we exercise control mm -hmm. that way. So I love all of what you're saying. Hey family, Lent is upon us. Uh, Lent is the time when we intentionally get to feel with God, uh, considering he went through a lot to feel with us. Uh, Lent is where we get to see the longings and the passion of Jesus and him coming to step into our world as a co-sufferer uh, so that he could send compassion and empathy to us as we suffer. I spend a lot of time avoiding my emotions, my feelings, uh, with stimulation. And Lent is always good for me, always good for me. And it's, it's always good news to know that there's a God who wants to feel with me as I hurt through life. Uh, so this Lent, I'm gonna actually be reading this book. It's called The Proven Path by Joel Hesch. Uh, it's the story, well, it's three stories. Uh, three different guys who are struggling with lust in three different ways. And they're from different demographics. Some of them are married, some of them have different ethnic backgrounds, different ages. So I'm really looking forward to it because it allows me, well, the plurality of their stories allows me to see my story and their stories. Uh, so I wanted to invite you into this reading, into reading The Proven Path with me, uh, and to, well, just engaging that parts of who we are, so that we could start to prepare ourselves for Easter and for resurrection, and for all that Jesus, well, really actually has for us, instead of just lip service to something that we don't necessarily believe. So uh, come read this with me, it'll be in a link down below. Uh, thank you, and let's get back to the episode. I guess I'd be interested, there's something that sets you on this journey. Um, I suppose it probably had something to do with seeing Jesus differently. Um, and so before, during, after, um, how have you started to see Jesus differently as you've been on this particular 
expedition with him? Mm, okay, that is such a great question. Um, well, I'll, I'll go back a little bit to April mm. of this past year of 2020. And this was right after I'd had a breakup. Mm. I, I prayed, Jesus, show me what it means that you are the bread of life. Mm. Because I was at the point where I'm thinking there is such a dissonance between what Jesus says. He says, I'm the bread of life. Basically, you're not going to go hungry. You're not going to be thirsty if you have me. And then I feel like I'm starving. I've been praying for this for years and gives good gifts to his children, right? Mm. And yet here I am with this desire yeah. unfulfilled. So I said, I must be missing something mm. because Jesus never lies. Mm. He's never told a lie. And I must be the one who has something wrong. Mm. So that was my bold prayer far before I came to that breaking point in the summer was Jesus, show me what it means that you're the bread of life. And the thing is, is that he, he answered in a way that was unexpected, but it was so in line with his character. Yeah. Um, he showed me that there's a difference between being satisfied in Christ, mm -hmm. in Jesus, as you hear that phrase thrown around in the church often, I don't know if you heard this while you were single, but, Oh, you know, you just need to be satisfied in Christ yeah. so it's, it's, that comes across kind of like a platitude and you're like, well, I'm trying, what does that mean? Yeah. Um, it's also, it's also condescending. Oh yeah. 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 It doesn't feel very, <laughs> it's like, Oh, so you're saying you have something I don't have and I need to know him better or I need to right. work on my holiness better. It's, it's not right. very kind. No, no. And when someone says that to you, you say, you know, it feeds this narrative that says, once I'm satisfied in Christ, he's going to give me a spouse. Like I have to fake God out, yeah. which is ter a terrible way of relating to him. So that's yeah. kind of where I started was, God, I'm not going to try to fake you out. I know you're better I see. than all of what I've been chasing. I want to know, I want to know that at the heart level. Mm. I want you to show me that. Mm. So I think what, what he really showed me was, and I, I want to kind of touch on C.S. Lewis's work on heaven, was that I was misunderstanding what it meant to be satisfied in Christ. Um, I thought what it meant was that I would essentially be stripped of all desire. Mm. I thought being satisfied in Jesus means I'm not going to want to get married. I'm um, not going to want a family. I'm not going to want any of this. But what he showed me is that that's not what it means. And, and the way he showed me that was through studying his very person. What was his life like on earth? What did, was he not satisfied in the efficacy of his own deity? Was yeah. he not satisfied in his father? Because at, in Gethsemane, he was sweating blood. I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that because he was suffering and because he didn't have this kind of medicated type joy um, that he was not satisfied in the father. So there's a separation between having desires and then being completely complete in Christ mm. and knowing that. Mm. So he shifted that fr from the shame. I had been feeling so much shame that I can't, mm. I can't override this desire with love for Christ. And because I have this desire, I'm less spiritual. I'm less of a Christian. Mm. And he basically just showed me no hope. That's not true. You can have this desire. I was on earth with, with desires. And I mean, actually part of this journey was when I first started listening to the naked gospel is a conversation with you and Bronwyn Lee. And she just brought up a very obvious point that Jesus was celibate and he was not asexual. Mm. <laughs> so, uh, oh, okay. I'm in good company. And because perhaps, um, he, we don't know if he desired a wife and a family, but he of course had sexual desires that didn't make him any less satisfied in his father. Mm -hmm. It didn't make him less, any, any less purposeful. So really teasing that apart and seeing Jesus is my great high priest. Mm -hmm. He is with me in this. He is not standing far off saying, you're not spiritual enough. You haven't overcome this desire in a Buddhist type manner. Mm. So therefore, you know, I'm pushing you away from it. It was the exact opposite and seeing Jesus that way for who he, he is and how he existed mm. on the earth was very comforting. Mm. I love all of that. Yeah. Bronwyn's conversation was uh, challenging and beautiful mm -hmm. and a lot of fun. I, I, you've gotten mm -hmm. to speak with her recently. Was that pretty yeah. cool? Yeah. 
That was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Again, I went away from that conversation feeling super inspired. I thought, yeah. okay, I can, I can be single for another 10 years. Yes. It's her, <laughs> it's her accent too. It just drives it home. There's just something about her accent that I know you don't want, you don't want to turn away. I know it's true. Just like, just keep talking. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh -huh. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, no, all of that is good. And Jesus, well, Jesus is pretty awesome. And I think that question of, so there's this picture of satisfaction to be satisfied is to not like hurt or crave or long or question. Uh, and then you saying, what was that case, the case for you, Jesus, you were obviously satisfied, but then we see you hurt. We see you hurt real right. big. Uh, mm -hmm. so there's gotta be some kind of disparity there. We're conflating things about like, like uh, satisfaction and happiness. We're conflating those two things. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes like there's such holy moments when you're able to sit with somebody in their grief or in their hurts when they lose a parent or whatever it might be. But those are those are the moments where, where you, you're, you're always thinking, like, I, I have no idea what to say. But then it, it clicks into place really quick. It's like, I'm just supposed to be here. Like they won't remember mm. anything I say. They're hurt. Like I just need to be here. Yeah. And some of the most sacred moments that are the most satisfying have nothing to do with happiness per se, as at least as we understand it. So I think, uh, I think you applying that to, to what it means to be human and, and then it, it seems like you were analyzing our cultural language, our church cultural language by Jesus' life. Really beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love that whole process. I'd never, I don't think I've ever, ever thought of it with that, with that, that train of thinking. It's really, it's really good hope. Um, okay. I... I do want to know what, what about, so you went three months and so that's three months of dying, <clears throat> right? Like three months of dying to options, um, yeah. dying to the possibility. Um, um, what did it look like to know Jesus during those three months? I, I asked mm. because I have this friend, uh, and she's the only person I know who, rocks singleness. Like she has desires for mm -hmm. sure, but she'll have an experience and she'll get all giddy and she'll be like, I'm so excited to talk to God about this later, you know, or yeah. she'll have an experience and she just wants to process it with him. And she's like, I'm just going to run home real quick or I got to go journal. Or like I'm going to go into the woods. And she's just this little, this little fairy that goes through life and just experiences thing with God. And she shares things. She doesn't use that to withhold information. But God really is her best friend. And when she hurts, she just wants to know him. She just wants hmm. to say, like, do you do you know what it feels like to be me? Like those kinds of questions uh, are a big part of her interior life. And I really admire it. So what was it like? What was it like for you to say, OK, three months of, of death and options? Satisfaction isn't happiness. So, God, what does it look like for me to actually be satisfied with you? Hmm. So I, in a sense, <clears throat> I would say it was a, a detox in the way that I related to God. And that's, that's essentially what revealed to me how much he'd ar always already been loving me, how much he had already been walking with me and providing for my needs. And I, I guess I would describe it like this was that I was so focused on this one thing that I was relating to God primarily through that of every time I would pray. Yes, I would pray for others. Yes, I would praise him, but always tacked on the end. And don't forget about this mm. or giving him advice. Don't forget about this. So it's this very small view of God of, mm. I have to remind him, I have to remind him of my needs. And when I, I decided I wasn't going to do that, it was like the greatness and love of who he was just opened up. And it's very, it's hard to put that into tangibles mm. because it was such a, a personal experience. But what I can say is when mm. I stopped praying about that, mm. I would just be reading scriptures and before I think almost every scripture I would read, I would somehow in my mind relate it to singleness. You know, I'd read the, the, um, for, I'm forgetting which chapter on God gives good gifts to his children. And, you know, he's talking about the Holy spirit, but I wasn't reading it through my own biased lens. Mm. So in that way, scripture came alive to me and mm. I saw him, I saw his character mm. in so many other aspects. And I, and I also, another, another way that I would describe it is as before, my world was kind of grayscale because I was so fixated on this. When I put that aside, 
my life became vivid and colorful and I was able to see his grace and his movement in all of these aspects of life that I had been blind to mm. because I refused to see it. Mm. I refused to see it. So again, I don't know how tangible all that is, mm. but what I can say is that putting that aside and replacing it with scripture and, and purposing mm. not to read it through the lens of my own narrow desire mm. just really revealed to me how good he is. Mm. And, you know, oh, go ahead. No, please. Um, I was going to say coming out on the other side of this, I mean, it's been two or three months, I believe, since I ended my mind. I mean, I'm of course, I still have a lot of transformation to go through, but I'm still I'm still seeing life through that colorful lens yeah. and I don't want to lose that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Hope. And thanks for letting me ask. I know that that's a, uh, it's a personal question. Um, I do want to know. Uh, so I know what you're talking about, about reading, reading scripture through kind of this lens of scarcity of, of, mm -hmm. of deficit. Um, yeah. and sometimes we read it through like abandonment, you know, it's like seeing what God <laughs> isn't as he tells us what he is. Yeah. And we can read it in a challenging way. Like, Oh, will you, will you really show up this way? Um, as opposed to just, just reading to know him. Yeah. Um, uh, I like this cause Bronwyn brought it up and it's still something I'm sitting with. Uh, it's, it's more of a cultural observation, but it's certainly experiential. Uh, Bronwyn brings up the point that that uh, a big part of the narrative with singleness in our heads is that we're not fully human until we get married. Um, we yes. even have language for that about like your other half, right? As though you're only half of a human being, half of yourself mm -hmm. until you meet that other person, then you're, then you're fully human. Then you're a real person. Um, did you have some of that experience? Was that informing your reading of scripture? And was that, if it was, then was that touched on at all during those three months of like hope you are a, a, a woman and you're a fully formed human being. Mm -hmm. uh, Bronwyn's so good there, but I was just wondering if that was a part of your, your, your narratives inside. Definitely. Definitely. I, I do feel, and this goes along with the affirmation piece of feeling that I needed a man to affirm mm. that I was a woman, mm. that I wasn't some <laughs> androgynous creature. Yes, yes. Um, so I, I definitely went through that. And I mean, I, we might talk about this later, but that was a message I received from the church. I'm, I mean, I, I want to say I, I haven't received that from everyone in the church, but that was definitely a message I received was that you are not, uh, you are not an adult mm -hmm. until you're married, until you have children, you have some kind of deficit. Yeah. But I good. think from the perspective of being a woman, I, I did, you know, and I, I had to say, Lord, I need you to fill in the gaps. You know, I'm not, not having a man tell me I'm beautiful, but I know I'm complete in you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look back even, even to a relationship I was in and I was so sure of my, I don't know, worthlessness, but, mm -hmm. but I, I was in this, this, um, mode of auditioning for love that when my boyfriend would tell me he thought I was beautiful, I wouldn't believe him. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't believe him. And, and that all stems from, am I viewing myself as complete in Christ? Am I viewing myself as full in Christ? And, and yeah, I mean, through the three months, I, I think I, I blossomed, mm -hmm. you know, I can actually say I blossomed. It was, it was right when I decided to do that, that, God started bringing all of these opportunities to me to really pursue my passion. You know, I had a lot of people all of a sudden reach out to me and ask me to write. I mean, you, you reached out to me and it was very sudden. It was almost exactly after I had decided to do that. And I thought God showing me like, daughter, I have all of this mm. for you. You are not defined by being in a relationship. Even if you're never in a relationship, you have so much that I have for you to do and you are fully loved. And when I embraced that, I, I, you know, honestly at the end in December, I was like, Oh, I think I'm okay with being single for a little bit longer. Mm. I really, I really am. Mm. That's huge. That's really yeah. cool. He gave you a new story and, yeah. and that he would, I like, <laughs> I like how he goes out of his way to show us that we're valuable, you know, that we yeah. mean something to him. He's, he's yeah. incredible. I, I liked, cause you said that earlier, you said, um, he never does anything out, outside of outside of his character, but he is so creative. He is yes. he blows me away with his creativity. 
I've never seen someone. Yeah, I've never seen someone so creatively love people in a diverse, yeah. a diverse sort of way as I've seen God. It's just, it unravels me. It's a, it's a very peculiar thing. He is. Yes. I, it makes me think. I was thinking the other day about uh, there in Peter where it says, "Salvation is something angels long to look into." <laughs> I was wondering if like they if they like looking into it because they get to see creative and new ways uh, that God hmm. loves us. You yeah, know, it really does blow me away. It blows me away. OK, uh, let's um, let's talk about the church a little bit. Um, <clears throat> um, you can really approach this however you want. Uh, I, I'd just be interested in your thoughts. So whether it's um, what you'd like to see in the church, things you mm-hmm. wish you'd had in the church growing up at the very least um paul talks quite highly about singleness you know Mm -hmm. and that's not something that was i didn't i don't ever remember that being preached necessarily um Mm -hmm. him elevating singleness the way he does and he acknowledges that it's his opinion but nonetheless i i trust the guy um Mm -hmm. and jesus was obviously single and uh and that that really that message that wasn't necessarily given. Um, so even if you start there, but I know even a lot of the form. So for instance, when it comes to Sunday school class, and all of a sudden you you bump into like the adult Sunday school classes once you get married, and all of a sudden mm-hmm. people start reaching out to you to come over for dinner and to hang out and spend time, you and your your spouse, uh, which is just a really beat up way of affirming and practicing family, and we do it accidentally. It's it's the it's the narrative the church narrative that we've received, but a lot of churches do it that way. And a lot of people just think intuitively that way. So I'd be interested about your experience and uh, some of your thoughts there. Sure, sure. So I'll start with growing up Mm -hmm. and then I'll move on to, because what you just just said uh, recently, that's something I've been experiencing Mm -hmm. and I really would love to unpack that. But I think just Mm -hmm. growing up in the church, singleness was not presented as an option and marriage was presented as the epitome of human experience. I wonder if I had been presented with an either or, if my mind would have gotten in these, in this kind of rut of Mm. thinking that something was wrong because I wasn't married. And, you know, I think also the culture was a bit different in our parents' generation. You know, my parents met when they were 22, 23, when they were in the navigators ministry. And, you know, it was, that was the story I grew up with. My parents never told me, hope we expect you to get married. We want grandchildren. My parents never, but I grew up on their love story and the love story of my youth pastor and his wife. And there were all these narratives, you know, write down a list of 25 things you want in your future husband, because that's what God did for me down to the guitar playing and blue eyes, you know? And so you're 12, 13, this is very formative. And, you know, I'll just be honest. I, I was so impacted by my youth pastor and his wife in such a good way that I wanted their life. And when I went to college, I ended up changing majors. I started, I went to a Christian college. I majored in youth ministry because I wanted to meet and marry a youth pastor and live there exactly. I wanted their story. Hmm. And in my mind, it was, it was kind of like at 22, if you hadn't met someone, like all hope was lost. And I know I wasn't the only one who received that message. Um, so I would say that's kind of what it was like growing up and it was all unintentional and there was never anyone who directly said being single is bad, but you always felt bad for the people who were single. Mm. Like, you know, people, you'd hear people talk, Oh, I wonder when she's going to meet someone, you know, you'd hear that. And then you'd see the people who seemed very purposeful, married, working for the kingdom. And, you know, I'd always, I'd always loved Jesus. And I just thought, you know, I want a teammate. I want to do this with someone. And, um, and, and then I was surprised when it didn't happen. Mm. And, you know, most of my friends are, beautiful women in their thirties and they're all like, what happened? You know, so we're, we're all in this place. Um, so that's what I would say. I, d- I don't know. Did you receive similar messages growing up in the church? For sure. Yeah. And I, I, I feel like even saying, um, uh, even saying surprise is a euphemism. I was surprised when mm-hmm. it didn't happen uh, more like yeah. disillusioned and, yeah. and not just disillusioned about relationships or about yourself, but disillusioned about God and your faith. Like those sorts of things mm-hmm. will creep up. At least they've, they've creeped up for me and I've seen them creep up for my communities in the past. So yeah, very, very similar. I, um, 
Yeah, I'm with you on all of that. I I, I am interested to know because I've learned the the question that falls out of this is what maybe needs to exist or what do we mm-hmm. what do we long or hope to exist? Um, I've learned all of my imagination here about what I long to exist, like uh, the actual form of it was, has been yeah. given to me from people like Wesley Hill who are mm. they're gay, mm-hmm. you know, they're not, they're not yeah. even, you know, they're, they're not even heterosexual, but they've taught uh-huh. me about what it, cause, so they're, they're, they're celibate. They practice celibacy in the kingdom of God. They have same sex attraction. Um, and they know they're lonely and they want to know if the gospel has resources for their loneliness, not mm-hmm. for their horniness, for their loneliness, yeah. you know, yeah. and yeah. Uh, a lot of people do that translation work so quickly. It's like, oh, well, they're just they're just horny and that's their sacrifice. Like, well, No, they're lonely. No. And you know what that's no. like. Like if you're, yeah. if you're being honest with yourself, you know what loneliness is like, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to physical affection. And so reprocessing that and reexamining it. It's because of their work that I have imagination for that stuff. And I, mm-hmm. I think that their resources, the resources that they're trying to give to one another, are applicable for single people all over the place. I had heard somebody say, and I, I do like it, I had heard somebody say, because um, the gift of singleness is is this weird <laughs> sort of phrase, weird sort of language. Yeah. Um, and how do you know and when do you know and those, those kinds of things. And if you don't have it, then it's almost as if your goal in life is to get married. Yeah. Um, which is just a, a real, I think it's a beat up way of approaching that gift in particular. And somebody had said, you have the gift of singleness as long as you're single, you know? Mm-hmm. And that was, that was actually quite liberating. It's like, oh, like it's not my control. I don't need to make it my story, these sorts of things. Um, and so what does it look like to inhabit singleness well and to love folks who are single? And at the end of the day, uh, marriage won't satisfy you right it doesn't complete you i've read so many stories so many stories of uh 60 70 year old men coming home after work or after they've been out or whatever and there there are questions they wish their wives asked them and their wives never Hmm. asked them you know they have to coach them or tell them that you know and there's nothing like it's somebody doesn't won't know your soul intuitively to the point where they can ask exactly what you need and they want to be known still even after 50 years of marriage uh, mm-hmm. so yeah, um, that's, uh, that's me kind of shotgunning my response in your direction, but I, I am, I do want to know your thoughts on what does it look like to be a family where there are folks mm-hmm. who are married and folks who are single, yeah. <clears throat> uh, what do you think is lacking and what do you think is needed? Yeah. There? Um, well, I think I want to start with two things and I, I hope I don't paint them too negatively, but I think I'll have to paint the negative before I can paint the positive. Um, the first thing would be viewing singles as f- fully formed people that are not lacking anything. Um, also viewing them as adults. So I'll just give a few examples that have frustrated me in the past. And I want to say I have had so many wonderful pastors, people who have affirmed my gifts, and this is not a blanket statement, but there have been a number of times I've gone to churches where the pastor will give me a high five and say, hi, young lady. And I'm like, I've never in my life been treated like that in a professional atmosphere. I I shared an office with two old men for a whole year. Mm. And they always treated me Mm. like I was on their level and they Mm. weren't believers. I never once felt that they talked to me condescendingly. So when a a pastor, you know, I'm like, okay, maybe they're trying to protect their marriage. I get it, but I don't need a high five. You can at least give me a handshake, you know? So there's that sense of, that's really good hope. You're not, you're not an adult. And it's Mm. like, I have so many gifts to offer the church that Jesus has given me. And I don't need a ring on my finger to use those gifts. Mm. And, and, you know, by extension, I had a friend And I thought, is this all in my head? Am I just insecure? And she told me she got married. And at the very same church, right after she got married, she she was asked to lead a Bible study. She started getting invited to things. She was drawn into this family. And I thought, okay, this is not just me. This is real. Mm -hmm. So I would say that also connects to viewing singles as adults with gifts to offer the church and drawing them into the family. Um, When I go to church, I'm at a new church and it's very hard to connect with people because I don't have a lot of points of commonality, but I would love it if someone would come up to me and talk to me and not, not push me off into a group for people like me. 
Um, you know, I'll, I'll share kind of a humorous example that, that sadly is extending into my 30s. So when I was in college, my roommate and I would go to this college ministry at a church. And right when we got there, they'd, they'd funnel us down into the basement. And we never interacted with anyone from the church. And they would give us Dunkin' Donuts. And I remember I was so frustrated one day. And I just said to her, I said, why do they just sequester us in the basement with donut holes? I can't stand this anymore. So I still often feel sequestered in the basement with donut holes. Mm. Um, when I began going to a church at one time, I wanted to get involved in a small group that was multi-generational. I want to learn from older women. I want to be able to offer my gifts to younger women. I want to be able to interact with couples, um, get to know them. But I, I found out that I got some pushback on that. I said, I'd love to join and they said, oh, we have a young professionals group. And I said, well, I'd like something more intergenerational. And they said, okay, you can look on the website. There are a lot of small groups where you must be married. You must be 35 or older. And I'm like, okay, I'm 29. I'd like to get to know, but there's no small group for me. So I think there needs to be really an embracing of singles. I also read um, a blog post by a single woman a few days ago. It was on Valentine's Day. And she wrote, the title was, if one more person tells me my maker is my husband on Valentine's Day, I'm going to punch something. And her, but her, her point in that was often people will say that and then not follow through. And it's like that passage in James of, you know, right. go be fed, be warm. Yes. Without oh, saying, so good. Oh, yeah, come yeah. over to our house and hang out with our kids, mm. you know? Yes. No, that's so good. That's excellent. I never uh, thought of that passage that way. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah. That's terrible because we use that sort of language to um, pawn off responsibility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We do. We yeah. pawn off responsibility. And you're totally right about uh, churches often keeping uh, single folk or young folk in some kind of sequestered space, as you say. And it really is. It's just kind of like a kind of a, the dog pound. You know, you drop off your kid or whatever. <laughs> and until they're adopted and brought into a real family uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. via marriage. So I, I think that's really good. I do. Um, yeah. My response. Yeah. I think I think a lot of millennials are dis- disillusioned with church. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think not just disillusioned. I think there's bitterness. I think there's real bitterness. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So sorry, my thoughts are going a lot of different directions and I don't want to get myself in trouble either. Um, so I, I do think that uh, I think anybody can know, can know God in satisfying ways. I just think it, it costs looking at your boredom and your hurt and your loneliness. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think that cost freaks us out. I think it freaks us out. There might be, uh, there might be something that, that people need to be brought into and the idea that God can actually speak back, like God actually talks. Um, that, that's, that might not be known, but I think that if that's known, people seem to know intuitively that if we put down our devices for like five or 10 minutes, God will actually meet us. Like he actually will, but we're terrified of doing that because what else will meet us? What else? It'll be there. There'll be pain and hurt and abandonment and all sorts of scary, scary things, scary voices telling us we're a disappointment and we're a failure and whatnot. And what if those voices and what if those sensations are louder and more powerful than God? Mm -hmm. What if they get us first? Right. Then then God can't save us from them. Maybe maybe he won't. What if he doesn't? You know, and those those sorts of uh, really quick thought experiments that we run through in our heads, they they keep me, <laughs> they keep me uh, from ever really knowing God. And I think ways that are actually meaningful. I think they're salvific ways, ways that actually have to deal with salvation. And we do see salvation as kind of a one and done. And there's there's a there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, scripture uses uses salvation that way it also uses it as a very relational process and i i do i need the gospel every day like every day i need to know uh that god is for me right that god is with me that god loves me and cherishes me and every day i need to say god can you show me your affection and your gentleness to me you know Mm -hmm. um i need to be saved every day and Mm -hmm. and i don't mean in some kind of big s way um yeah but i do i I, in any relational sense like i need to be known every day just to know that Mm -hmm. my parents loved me once isn't enough to know that they're Mm -hmm. they're they're present to me every day right and uh but they show that they're present to me every day because when i call they're always there you know they're Mm -hmm. always there um i don't know 
Uh, I don't know if those thoughts are right. Um, do you have any uh, kind of reaction to those thoughts when it comes to when it comes to singleness and when it comes to being married? I think those things are true, and I think that if we don't know how to pursue Jesus and allow ourselves to be pursued by Jesus in stillness mm-hmm. and in quiet places, uh, then we will put a kind of a, a messianic frame on our spouse, uh, or we'll spend our whole lives running. Um, mm. And I think that's just on an individualistic level. But I think that being able to articulate that has helped me say, okay, then what can we do better in community to facilitate that? How can we be Mm. present to each other in Mm -hmm. ways that actually address hurt and loneliness? But it might be, that that approach might be wrong. I'd just be interested in your thoughts. Hmm. Well, I think you hit on something really important when you use the word messianic frame. Hmm to describe a spouse. I think we're, we're definitely in danger if that is our, our focus. And that does happen. Like you said, when we are not pursuing Jesus, when we are not, uh, when that is not our priority. Um, so I would say on a personal level, yes, hmm. if I, it doesn't matter how wonderful the person that I marry is if I put that messianic frame on them. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm searching for my satisfaction in the wrong place and they're never going to be able to live up to those expectations and I'm going to be constantly hurt and that marriage is not going to be, um, it's not going to be as fruitful. So, but, but that's regardless of whether you're married or you're single, it's the same, the same idea of fruitfulness. Mm. So I totally agree with that. I think, Mm. I think we need that privately, but you're right. We also need it corporately. And I think um, one way we could do that, and I'm, I guess I'm going back to this idea of family, is if there are people who are married or older and they're intentionally investing in the lives of their single brothers and sisters, and not just physically inviting them over, but doing those kind of check-ins, like how how is your heart doing? Can we pray together? Mm -hmm. Being able, going beyond those superficials, because even in, I guess, say the married community of the church there, there does sometimes tend to be like a little bit of superficiality, you know, the small talk at the small group, Mm -hmm. rather than like, what is going on in your heart? Mm -hmm. So there can tend to be this facade of everything's going well. And church is something I do and I check it off on Sunday and I have a good job. Um, So, so yeah, I think it's, it's willing to be vulnerable too. And like willing to take that first step. And it's so surprised me so many times, like I'll take the step to be vulnerable and someone will say me too. And I haven't Mm. talked with this about anyone. Mm. And then there's that strength in community Mm. where you can pursue the answer and pursue Jesus together and see his goodness together. Yeah. I like that. That's one of the things the pursuing the, okay. Gosh. Okay. So pursuing the the loneliness and the hurt while at the same time, the messianic framing of this will save me. I see you in get, like, that's why I admire the three months that you did. Cause that, mm-hmm. that was you saying, I don't, that's not my Messiah. That yeah. the possibility of me getting married one day is not my God. Mm-hmm. It's not my Jesus. Uh, I know Jesus right now. Right. Yeah. And I yeah. will, I will crush those lies. I will spend the next three <laughs> months looking at those broken narratives and mm-hmm. I will go, I will go I will go into war with these things. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I admire. And then there is, uh, then because we don't just want to leave it there. Well, that's what I hear you saying. Where it's, uh, it's be warmed and filled. You know, it can be a superficial. It's like, oh, well, they're pursuing their pain, and it's like, well, no. How do we do that together? Yeah. Like, what does it look like to have togetherness there? And my wedding's coming up, and I have a few. This doesn't. This doesn't violate anybody's confidence, but there are a few people in my my wedding who are celibate because they 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 have some sex attraction. You know, mm-hmm. they, they mm-hmm. live life of celibacy and they're incredible. They're some of my best friends. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, and I want to honor them by allowing them to be part of my, my marriage. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I also don't just want to, it to end necessarily with like a, a with a, a visual platitude that makes me maybe look good, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, that's something Kaylee and I process together. What does it look mm-hmm. like to build a community where we can where we're not siloed in our marriage i love that i absolutely and that's the that's the thing is i mean i think your long journey of singleness has given you so much empathy Mm. 
And you're going to be one of those cultural change makers. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely beautiful. You and your wife are going to do that. And Mm -hmm. I think that's what's going to spark the change in the church Mm -hmm. are those of us who have experienced the pain. And yeah, and and it's not just going to be on your wedding day. They're standing with you. You're going to be inviting them into your life because you know the journey and you know the pain. Amen. Thank you for that hope. (laughs) I I receive it. I do. With all my heart, I do. Because I love them so, so much. Uh, Mm -hmm. and, uh, loneliness is why suicide is an all time record high. You know, like, I mean, it's, uh, people are, are offing themselves, hoping that there's more peace and rest and death Mm -hmm. than they're able to find in life. And that is not okay. No, that is just, (laughs) uh, so sad. Okay. Um, uh, hope you're a gift. Um, I don't want to end on a kind of a disparate note. (laughs) Let's see. Why don't you, if you're okay with it, maybe share a story or two about a way that you've been loved in your singleness, whether Mm -hmm. by roommates or by those in the church in some kind of meaningful way as a, as an example, that's been, been life-giving. I use your phrase from earlier, life-giving for you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't. I do not want to be completely negative, and I, I hope I wasn't too negative. Uh, it's me. You're doing great, is it? <laughs> okay. Is it? Yeah, yeah, you're doing great. Um, I well, I, you know, I, I'm going to name some names because mm-hmm. these people deserve to be honored. Mm-hmm. Um, Pastor Steve mm-hmm. of Bethel, where mm-hmm. I went for a while, he um, he he does such a great job of affirming people's gifts, mm-hmm. and he so encouraging in my gift of writing, you know, he doesn't see through the single married lenses. You know, he just told me one day, you know, God's going to give you a platform to share, like, you know, God, God's put this in you. And so I, that, that for me is loving people into their gifts. And I really, really appreciate that. Um, I would say from, from afar, Bronwyn Lee, you know, she, she she sees the need and she is an encourager. And I would encourage everyone to, to read her stuff. Um, um, you know, my family, Mm -hmm. my parents, they do such an amazing job of, I know a lot of people my age, their parents are pressuring them. They want grandkids. My parents never view me differently because of my singleness. And Mm -hmm. they also caution me into making too big of a deal about it. Mm -hmm. So I would, um, I would say that. And then there's also so many families around the U S that I know Mm -hmm. that would, you know, if I wanted to couch surf across the U S I know they love me. I know they have my back. I have, Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's, it's in this COVID season, um, where virtual is more and more common, it's it's in a funny way helped me reconnect to mentors all around the country. So, um, and then another couple, um, Farid and Zaina, they're some of my good friends. They um, they welcome single people into their home all the time, and they never treat you differently because they're they're single. You know, and Farid's an example of someone who can be. Uh, just an amazing brother in Christ. Um, like he's, he's the type of person who can um, like give you a hug and you feel so safe. And he has, you know, he has great boundaries, but he knows how to be a brother. He knows how to be a brother. So like I can list off all of these people who have embraced me in my singleness. You know, I could go on for 10 minutes, but there are people, Mm -hmm. there are people out there who, who are just, who are just there to, to love you. So it's not, it's not a completely dismal picture. So totally bleak. Yeah. It's not totally bleak. Yes. And I'm, you know, I'm encouraged. I really yeah. am encouraged. Yeah. And that is Jesus's way more often than not to work with a remnant, um, to work with the margins and the outliers, uh, to make his family known. And, uh, yeah. and they are, they're always there. They are always mm-hmm. there. You just have to, you just have to look. And that's it. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it's the same with Jesus. Those who seek, find, you know, and those who ask, receive, and those who mm-hmm. knock the doors open. And so Jesus, Jesus is like that. And he's always present in his family. So I, I'm with you. And I think that, I mean, the weightiness of a conversation like this, at least the weightiness I feel from a conversation like this, because I, I know what's beat up. I know the things that have beat me up and, and beat up people that I really care about. Uh, and it's an important conversation, um, but it just goes to show, I think the, the significance, 
that Jesus places on his own heart when it comes to a conversation like this. Like he was a man who was unknown, you know, yeah. he was estranged. He was rejected a man from whom people hid their faces, uh, mm-hmm. but he was acquainted with sorrow. And this, that kind of language is uh, so dynamic in describing what Jesus was like um, while at the same time, deeply unknown. And so yeah. just getting to know him and getting to know him with people is such a joy, such a joy. Thank yes. you. Hope hope. Uh, yeah. So we always end with two questions. One, um, how can people track with you? And two, mm-hmm. how can people, how can we be praying for you? Sure, sure. So I write at hopeunyielding.com. And I also am the host of a podcast called Hope Unyielding that you can look up on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. And the goal is really to proclaim God's faithfulness through personal story, because mm-hmm. I believe story is so beautiful and it's just such a such a way to point to god's faithfulness for those who are struggling so if you want to um, check either of those out um, i release an episode usually every week mm. um, how you can pray for me i'm kind of in career limbo mm. i have been for a while and i i would just appreciate prayer for direction and also the opening of um, the right position for me to step into mm. Hope, thank you for having this conversation. It's, it's important. Thank you for being here with us. Yeah, thanks so much, Shane. Yeah. <sighs> All right, everyone. That was uh, heavier than I think I thought it was going to be. Uh, but thank you for being with us. Thank you for thank you for feeling with us and thinking with us. I, I hope that you take this back and feel it on your own and think through it on your own, that you feel it with uh, the people you care about. And what does it look like to be known? And what does it look like to love well the people around us who are so unknown? Uh, and we all experience that. We all know what it's like to be unknown, uh, to be estranged, to, be, to want to be seen, and yet again to be unseen. Um, so there's a lot of empathy that we can extend to one another. And uh, there are a lot of ways that we can know and be present to one another. And I hope this conversation at the very least starts a conversation in your own life. Um, Your comments are always welcome. We would love your thoughts. Um, But thanks for being here. Thanks for being with us. And we will catch all of you next time uh, here on the Naked Gospel. Bye.